Welcome to the Cumbria Chamber of Commerce podcast, your regular update of business news and issues from around Cumbria. Find out how we support new business and help existing businesses to grow and flourish at cumbriachamber.co.uk. Now here's the Chamber's Business Engagement Manager, Julian Whittle, with the latest episode. Hello, I'm here with Stephen Hunter and Anthony Cox, tax partners at RSM, the Audit, Tax and Consulting Service Providers. Now, they were due to speak at the Chamber's Budget Breakfast in Kendall, which we were running in partnership with RSM. But regrettably, we we had to take the decision to cancel uh, because of the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, you know, bringing 130 people together in a confined space wouldn't have been the brightest thing to do at the moment. So this podcast is is the next best thing. Um, and Stephen and Anthony will aim to cover much of the ground that they would have done had the presentation gone ahead. So welcome, gentlemen. Um, well, what, what's your initial take on the budget? I mean, it was um, it was hard to believe that this was a, a Conservative Chancellor willing to spend freely uh, after a decade of austerity. I mean, there was £600 billion worth of infrastructure spending announced. That's over five years. That's just infrastructure spending. And then there was the, the, the coronavirus measures and so forth. Is this the sort of budget, is it what you expected? I guess we're in challenging times, aren't mm. we? Even before we heard about the coronavirus, um, businesses were suffering. Obviously, a lot of talk around Brexit and the election and the uncertainty that comes with that. And so I think most of your members will will relate to the fact that it has been challenging, particularly for the retail and the hospitality sector. Um, and then obviously, we've had the breakout of the coronavirus, mm-hmm. which has just compounded that. So I guess what I've been pleased around the budget is the fact that we've made some Swiss, swift um, changes and we're bringing in more funding to help businesses along the way. But I agree with you. I think there's been a lot of spending, or promises mm. to be spending, mm. um, but not many tax changes to bring the money in. So that's oh, so they're going to be able to meet this through growth um, and obviously through extra borrowing. And I think it's fair to say that the, the government uh, did indicate that they would spend quite a lot of money on infrastructure. They did in the manifesto, if yes. I like that up, Stephen, yeah. yeah. Um, well, Anthony, you just mentioned there the coronavirus measures. I mean, the first part of the Chancellor's speech was devoted entirely to, to measures to help businesses survive the coronavirus outbreak. Can the two of you talk me through these measures? Yes, I, I guess there's four measures broadly that uh, have been introduced or will be introduced to help businesses along this difficult period. Um, one is the business rate exemptions that, that are available for the smaller businesses um, they've been extended to make sure that we're covering both leisure, that's hospitality, up, and retail. That's up to two hundred and fifty employees, isn't it? I um, think that the, the it's well, it's rateable value. Oh, oh no, sorry, yes, I'm getting confused with the, with one of the others. Yes, you're right. It's it's rateable value under fifty one thousand, isn't it? That's yeah. correct. Yeah. yeah. So we're not sure how that's going to be administered because the councils haven't received the instructions yet. Um, but it might be that some of your members that meet that criteria will need to apply to their local councils um, but information is going to be provided to the councils on the 20th of March Right um, So that's been extended from retail to pubs and leisure and hospitality yes. which should help Cumbria a lot Yes And in particular on the pubs um, the discount of a £1,000 has been increased to 5000 discounting rates mm-hmm. So that's one measure to have a look at for your members um, The other one is around the statutory sick pay and up to 250 employees, yeah. um, there will be funding available for the first 14 days um, that a person is off with um, the uh, coronavirus. So they'll get the statutory sick pay that they pay out, reimbursed by the Correct. government. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, that hasn't really been determined how that's going to be refunded at the moment because the systems, the payroll systems, can't cope with that at the moment. Mm-hmm. So we're going to see how that transpires there might be a bit of delay on that no, right. <laughs> um, I think the one that probably is, av- is available immediately is the uh, time to pay arrangements which historically have been quite difficult to enter mm. into with HMRC mm. um, the Chancellor announced yesterday that 2,000 employees will be manned on the phones mm. there is a phone number now so it's up and running and that will probably be my first port of call mm. because money is available now in terms of deferring some of your cash mm. flow so you think that might be more? E- it'll it'll be easier for businesses to access that scheme than it might be at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And what I would say is that please speak to your accountant, your mm-hmm. local accountant, to uh, 
um, to help you with that process. Okay. And, and, and the fourth one really is the, um, the grants and the loans that are going to be available. Um, that's going to be administered by the British Bank, um, which has got 40 high street lenders on, on the... The uh, British Business Bank, yeah. Uh, and, and so you, you, would you contact, if you wanted to, if you're a business, you're interested in these, I think it's up to 1.2 million, aren't they? So they're decent amounts of, yeah. of, of money. Would you approach your normal bank and say, are you one of the, the, one of the lenders on this scheme? Yeah, I, I think I would. And I think the key thing to mention is this, this arrangement for banks to lend on behalf of the, the British Bank um, it's been set up already. It was called the Enterprise Finance Guarantee Scheme. Yeah. That's going to be relabeled to the Coronavirus Business Interruption <laughs> Scheme. Right. So um, what I would say is that it's up and running. Yeah. Um, there is support. I think the difference is that the government's going to guarantee um, 80% of the lend. Mm. So um, we, we, the bank should be well versed in this in terms of lending under this mm. arrangement. So I think, again, I would speak to your local bank manager. I would um, speak to your accountant again mm. and d- d- decide how you how best to approach the funds that you need. And, and for the smallest businesses, there's some £3,000 grants as well, aren't there, I think? Yeah, for small for small businesses that uh, have got, currently got the exemption for um, business, business rates. rates. Yep. Yeah. I think the key, what I would say to my clients and, and people and your members is that I think you've got to be on the front foot here. I think you've got to look at your cash flow over the next six to 12 months. Mm-hmm. If you do think there's going to be some challenges in there, you've got to be on the front foot on this mm-hmm. and make sure that you're speaking to your accountants and you, you understand what your cash requirement is going to be. Um, and you um, put some contingency plans in place. I mean, it struck me because this uh, 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 this time last year, you know, we were helping businesses plan for a no deal Brexit, and a lot of the the sort of Brexit planning about uh, managing cash flow and, and 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 looking at your supply chain in case that gets interrupted, it's applicable for coronavirus planning as well, isn't it? it it's, is. it's, it's a similar scenario. Yeah. It? yeah. Um, the business rates relief. I mean, it's a hundred percent but it's only for the eligible businesses in in retail hospitality and leisure but it is only for a year um now the chancellor did mention a fundamental review which is i think a phrase he lifted from the conservative manifesto uh but he's not the first chancellor to promise one of these i think uh, george osborne did when he was chancellor we, we still haven't had one but uh, he did indicate that we might hear more in the next budget the autumn budget um what do you think what what, what, what do you expect it to appear in this review and how do you think business rates might change as a result of it? I think that's quite a difficult difficult question to answer uh, with any certainty at this point. Um, I think uh, there's a vast amount of money involved with uh, business rates and I think uh, anybody who has any views on how it should be dealt with needs to take part in the consultation process with government and try and influence as much as possible what they what they mm-hmm. feel is the right outcome. I think at the moment it's really difficult to predict. I mean, it's difficult. So we looked at this as a chamber uh, a few months ago and it, it, business rates con- raises so much revenue that you know, if they wanted to do away with business rates and, and, and jack up corporation tax, it would have to go... To, from 19% right up to, I think, about 30% or so, yes. you know, in order to, to raise the same amount of revenue. So it, it's really going to be a difficult circle to square if they are going to reform. Well, of course, we've also got the situation that the this budget includes a digital services tax at 2% of revenue for uh, large businesses that, that deal mainly through the internet. Mm. Um, And they've been very adept at avoiding corporation tax, haven't they? They've been adept Mm. at avoiding corporation Mm. tax. And so it it remains to be seen whether that's successful or whether Mm. that needs to change in the future in line with international changes in how those companies are Mm. going to be taxed uh, and how much money is raised. I suppose if there's a lot of money raised from that, that might help with the business rates. Yes, yeah, yeah. I think I agree with all that, and I think the clearly, if if business rates are abolished, then a new tax system needs to be in place. But I think what your members um, should be should be asking themselves, it, or actually thinking about, is actually they need a fair system. Mm. If you've got a business on the internet or you've got a business in the high street, there should be a level playing field. Mm-hmm. And I think when the system when the system is eventually reviewed, it will have that in mind. And as long as that can be achieved, then I think that's the best that we can hope for. Yeah, well, we'll have to wait and see on that. Now, alongside the, it's, you almost got eclipsed by the budget, but, but earlier on, before before the Chancellor got up to speak, the Bank of England had announced a cut in the base rate from 075 
way down to 0.25%, which it has been there before, just after the, the Brexit referendum, but it's never been any lower than that. It is a record low. What impact do you expect this cut to have on the economy? And, and you know, I wondered, has the bank used all its ammo in one go? I mean, what, what else can it do if it needs to stimulate the economy a bit well, further down the line? Well, there's not a lot it can do on interest rates, <laughs> but, it's, but it's got the base yeah. rate at quarter of percent. But I suppose it could still do things like quantitative easing. Yeah. So th- there are still things that the bank could do if, if it needs to do later on. I mean, I personally think it's the right measure to do, given the yeah. circumstances that we are and the challenge that we're going mm-hmm. to have in the next three to six months dealing with this virus and the effects of that. Um, so it's a bold move. Um, um, the banks obviously will pass this on or should pass this on to yeah. um, your members. Um, and I think there'll be an immediate cash flow advantage of, of, of a fall in interest rates. And what I would also say is that banks have... have, have Done press releases. I've said that they're here to support their clients, mm-hmm. whether that's uh, holiday holidays from um, making payments from mortgages or interest. In so again, there are there are means of easing cash flow, and banks are being supportive around payment holidays in that in that respect. And um, I think for consumers who have who have been used to lower interest rates for their residential mortgages, that probably not many of those will be affected by this because they may well have locked in at fixed interest rates. Mm-hmm. But certainly businesses will take advantage because their rates will generally be variable. Now, the Chancellor believes um, the coronavirus outbreak will have a significant impact on the economy. But he also said it it would be temporary. Presumably he's right on that. But I I wondered how quickly you think businesses will bounce back. I mean, once the outbreak is contained, uh, will it will it be a, a, a back to normal, or, or will some businesses, you know, be mortally wounded, as it were, by by, by what they've suffered? I think it's very difficult to say because these are uncharted mm. territories. Um, I think it will be temporary, uh, and I think business will generally bounce back, but it's really. Very difficult to predict. Depends how long it goes on, I suppose. Doesn't yes, it? and it will it will affect some businesses much harder than others, I suppose. Mm. Um, sectors like hospitality, for example. Pro- of, yes, yeah. that's yeah. right. Hospitality in, in the Lake District is already recording cancellations, mm-hmm. and they could be you know badly affected. Yeah. Um, now, the Chancellor reiterated. Uh, one of the Conservatives' election manifesto pledges to keep raising the minimum, well, the national living wage, as it's called, for over 25s. Now, the increase to £8.72 an hour this April will mean it's risen by 30% since 2015. Mm-hmm. Um, his intention is to get it to two-thirds of median earnings by the end of this Parliament. So it's it's quite possible that we could be looking at a, 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 an hourly rate of £10.50 by 2024. How would you advise businesses to respond to that? And are there any particular sectors that this is going to be a, a major problem for? Well, I think clearly it affects the, the tourism and, and hospitality sector quite quite markedly. And Really, the only advice I think you can give to businesses is that that they all have to cope with it and comply with it. Um, the last thing you want to do is not be complying and be found out and named and shamed, as it were. Yeah. So I think it's really important that people do comply with it, and it, you know, it's it's a good thing in many respects because uh, it, it's it's important for the people to receive this minimum level of money. Yeah, I mean the sector I was I was perhaps thinking of was was retail because they've got a lot, and of course they're already we we've just been discussing over business rates the issue of online competition, uh, and and they yeah. tend to, you know, that it, it, it might accelerate pub closures is another one. Still, obviously, not back to hospitality though. Uh, we, we did some research as a chamber when the Low Pay Commission came up to Kendall, uh, I think two years ago now, uh, and the businesses were telling us it's you know it's not just the the staff on the minimum, because if you give you your lowest paid workers big increases percentage wise, then they start catching up people who have got a bit more responsibility, yeah. and then they say, "Well, 
hold on, <laughs> I want to rise too, otherwise yeah. they're getting paid the same as me and I'm, you know, I'm doing more. So it, it has this knock-on, this domino effect for a lot of businesses. When I, I think that's absolutely right. I think it's difficult times at the moment and the cost base for retail and hospitality mm. is increasing. Mm. And yeah. We've just talked about the uh, the national living wage mm. or the minimum wage. Mm. Uh, we talked about business rates mm. earlier. Mm. There's, a, there's a lot of cost rising in the, in the base. And I think all we'd say to our clients is, you're quite, as Stephen said, they've obviously got to adhere to the policy because mm. HMRC will come and, and do checks. And there's a naming and shaming. I think the key thing is to have visibility of your cash flow and to understand if you've got pressure points and mm. how you need to deal with them. So mm. so that would be my recommendation is to, you know, is to make sure that you're keeping an eye on your cash and you're taking advantage of the help that's out there to, to get you through this period and, and a future period. Okay. Now let's get on to the tax measures. I mean, you're, you're both tax specialists. I mean, I wondered, are you disappointed it wasn't a bit more radical as, 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 in terms of tax? I mean, a lot of the things we knew, I mean, we knew the national insurance threshold was going up, which he duly did. He froze... Duties on uh, fuel and alcohol. Fuel duty would be very welcoming. Freeze would be very welcoming. Cumbria. Um, it's not done anything to income tax personal allowances. Um, the corporation tax level, which again this was flagged up, wasn't it, before the budget that they yeah. were going to cut it to seventeen, which which was the original plan. Um, and there was a speculation that he was going to do away with entrepreneurs' relief. Now he didn't, but he he did curtail it, didn't he? Yes, he did. Um, it, before the budget, it was a, a situation that you couldn't sell your company and uh, on up to £10 million worth of, of gain, mm. you would pay only 10% tax. And that was given to you by Entrepreneurs' Relief. And the change in the, in the budget is that that £10 million is reduced to a million. Yeah. Now, I mean, I think, I think that's a, it's a good rate of tax, 10%. Um, I think for the vast majority of people... A million pounds is is a lot of money, so I think most mm. people will see it as a relatively fair change, mm. and it it's still available mm. for gains of up to a million pounds. So I think the message actually is that it hasn't been scrapped; it's still mm. there, and it's still quite valuable. It's worth a mm. hundred thousand pound if you mm. make a million pound disposal. I, I mean, most of these disposals would I be right in saying it happens when somebody. He wants to retire and they decide to sell yes, the business. Sell their business, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the vast majority of business sales um, by number are for within the million pound yes, gain range, right. aren't they? So, or, so it and, make... it, and, it's, and it's per individual. So mm. it, it could be that in a family situation, you might mm. have a husband that gets a million, a wife that gets oh, a million, right. and maybe even if, if, there's, if the, it's a family business, you might have later generations also mm. holding shares. So in actual fact, you could still find yourself with you know, several million pounds covered by the relief at 10%, which I think most people would see as being quite reasonable. Yeah. And I think what I would add to that is for, I mean, it's quite um, usual in owner managed businesses and private equity businesses for management to have shares as well or mm. share options. And one of those is the enterprise management incentive, mm. the EMI scheme. And that enables em- employees to get a 10% tax rate if they meet the qualifying con- conditions of holding the option or the shares. That's still going to be available, mm. the entrepreneur's relief, to for people who have gains of up to a million pounds. So it's still good news when it comes to employees as well, holding share options. Okay. I mean, another area where we thought he might clamp down was, was pensions tax relief, but he's, he, he hasn't, not only has he not done, he's actually gone the other way, hasn't he? He's, it's, it's more generous than it was. Yes, so so the issue with pensions tax relief, and this was affecting a lot of uh, doctors and consultants in the NHS, was that when they earned more than £150,000, they effectively lost the ability to put money into pension schemes. Mm. So apparently this was causing people not to go into work because mm. It, mm. they weren't getting their they weren't getting the ability to pay into pensions, it costing lots of money effectively to work that mm. extra those extra hours. So the change has been to increase that hundred and fifty thousand to two hundred and forty thousand, which will largely uh, help those NHS consultants and doctors. Um, there there is also there is a restriction though in that previously people who, large earners over 210,000 
were allowed to put ten thousand pounds in. Mm. Now, if you earn over a hundred, over three hundred and twelve thousand pounds, you will only be able to put four thousand pounds in. Right. So it has been restricted yeah. slightly, but for these big earners, though, they, everybody needs to look at their own affairs. Yeah. But they may find that they're able to contribute forty thousand pounds a year again into mm. their pension, which I think is is quite a good thing. It is. Um, He's raised the R&D tax credit from 12% to 13%. I mean, Anthony, explain how that works and, and how businesses can benefit. Um, I guess in terms of how business can benefit, I think within your business, if you're involved in a project that is aimed at achieving an advance in the overall knowledge or capability in the field, the field of science or technology, that's obviously a, a long phrase, but what it really means is if you're involved in a project mm-hmm. and it's difficult... There's a lot of uncertainty about it's taken a, a period of time then you could qualify for this relief um, and to give you some some examples of that it might be that you're trying to produce a cheaper product and so you introduce a new material and that new material doesn't integrate very well with the rest of the other um, items that are in that make up that product mm. that could be that could be R&D situations where um, this food and beverage companies where they're trying to introduce low salt mm-hmm. or low sugar and they want it to taste the same. Mm. Again, that could be R and D. So, if you're developing a new process, mm. that could be new, that could be R and D. Um, and even in the areas of systems integration, mm. in terms of IT, there could be technological um, uncertainties and challenges that are in, that make yeah. up there. So, anybody that's involved in any of those types of things should be asking their questions of their accountants. Could we get R and D tax credits on this? Yeah, well, because I, I suspect that maybe some businesses think that, that you know if they haven't got a department of boffins with white coats that oh well, we don't do R and D, but yeah. in fact they do. You know, yes. and, it, yeah. and they could be eligible for that. I think you'd be surprised how yeah. many different businesses can actually mm. do do R and D. I often think that a successful business is almost always doing R and D, and that's usually quite often the reason why they're successful. Yeah. So, so in terms of the actual change, there's two types of scheme. There's a small and medium-sized enterprise scheme, which is generally, well, there's obviously for smaller businesses, as the name suggests, mm. um, and the key there is about 500 employees. So if you've got less than 500 employees, you claim under the small and medium sch- uh, enterprise scheme. This particular change relates to the large ones, so it's right. businesses that have got more than 500. 500. There's a few, right. a few other criteria, but that's yeah. sort of a, a, the basic rule. Okay. So... What way this relief would work is that for every hundred pound that you spend, mm. previously you would have got twelve back. You mm. now get thirteen, mm. so it's increased from twelve percent to thirteen, and that's how the, the relief works under the large scheme. Okay. Now, uh, one I must have to confess this was a new one on me. The structures and, and buildings allowance it rises from two percent to three percent. What 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 is that, and, and will the increase make much difference? This was first introduced um, on the 29th of October 2018, so it's been around for um, about about 18 months. Um, originally, when it was introduced, it was introduced at 2% straight line, so you get your tax relief over 50 years. And, and if you sell the, uh, the the property or the the item that we claim, you're claiming the relief on, um, you you transfer that at tax rate and down value, which mm-hmm. means that there's no clawback of your relief. So is this on any new building or an extension or anything like yeah, that? So what's yeah, so what's it available on? It's mm-hmm. available on new structures that are being mm-hmm. constructed or buildings, um, including conversions as well and extensions. Yeah. And I think one that gets missed quite a bit is obviously on refits. Mm-hmm. What I would say is that there is a, a capital allowance regime that you would qualify for tax relief on planting machinery or fixture and fittings. Mm. So this deals with the things that are really buildings that you couldn't yeah. previously claim any tax relief on. I see. You can yep. now. So it's good news because it's increased from 2% to, to 3%, which means you get your tax relief over 33 years as opposed to 50. So it's, it is good news, yes. Yeah. And um, another one that he mentioned, the employment allowance, that's up by a third to £4,000. Talk me through that and what, what it entails. So anybody that employs people at the moment mm. um, will be claiming a employment allowance of £3,000. Mm. From April of this year, um, that will go up to 4000 mm. as you as you stated, but it'll only be available, there'll be a cap, there's a, a limit introduced. So if, you're, um, if your employer contributions are more than 100000 a year, you'll not be able to claim the employment allowance. So it's really aimed, it's increasing the benefit to smaller businesses. I see, you're right. And that would broadly, I think Stephen and I worked out before, you may have, it may be around 35 to 40 employees. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Depends on the amount of money that they earn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, before you're affected. Before, before you're yeah. affected. Right. 
Uh, he, he abolished, um, we didn't see this coming really, he abolished relief for red diesel with exceptions, farming, fisheries, forestry, railway sectors he mentioned are not uh, are not hit by this and carry on getting um, the lower rate of duty on red diesel. So ex- explain what it is and, and who else, who, who's going to be affected by this because who else uses red diesel? Well this, this change comes in in April 22 so it, it's still a couple of years away. Right, yeah. Um, and for people who use um, vehicles just off road, yeah, uh, then they 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 use red diesel as opposed to white mm-hmm. diesel, um, and they don't they don't have the large taxes that go with mm-hmm. the red diesel, so it's much much cheaper. Yeah. Um, so as you say, the, the, this is going to carry on. It's already agreed that this is going to carry on for certain sectors mm-hmm. like farming. Um, the sort of businesses that we think are we've identified as, as perhaps being affected might, might be caravan parks yeah, unless exactly. they can somehow get into the definition of farming it doesn't sound very much like farming <laughs> does it? Um, uh, good luck with that yes. good luck with that one but, but actually the caravan park industry has a very strong lobby mm. with government mm. so it may be that they can uh, negotiate mm. in something uh a government level, or the other, the other industry. I think construction industry uses quite a lot of vehicles. Of course, yeah, yeah. off off Before road. Yeah. Uses quite a lot of red diesel, and I suspect they might struggle to get um, any exemption. Ah, oh, right. Yes, I say I, I get that. Um, but it's quite yeah, a big increase. Yeah. I think it's a big increase in yeah. costs for for these yeah. people. Because I think I think they're only paying eleven p a litre duty under on red diesel. So yeah, it's, 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 very, it's, it's much less. Much much less. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there any other tax changes uh, that either of you would want to highlight? I think um, in terms of encouraging investment and the environment, the environmental mm. aspects, yeah. electric vehicles are, are, are receiving 100% capital allowances on at the moment. Right, right. And um, as the longer the range in terms of the, the miles that they do mm. without needing to recharge, there are going to be some low and benefit in kind rates of starting about 2% in the next year. So uh, I think there's certainly some in tax incentives mm-hmm. around moving to electric vehicles. And I think, you know, I've spoke to a number of my clients recently and they're all moving to electric vehicles for the re- for the tax reasons. So they are working. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the other, the other thing is obviously the plastic agenda at the moment. Um, they are looking to introduce um, a plastic packaging tax, yeah. um, which won't come in for a while. But what it's trying to do is encourage people that use plastic packaging to produce their plastic pa- packaging mm. from 30% of recycled plastic. Okay. I think uh, there's a couple of things which have already been talked about, so weren't, didn't give, weren't given a lot of mention in the budget, but are coming in from April that people do need to not we'll lose sight of. Yeah. And one of those is uh, what, what people refer to as IR35. Um, so IR35 was actually something that was originally brought in in 2000, but has never been really applied mm-hmm. by uh, by HMRC. This is the contractors thing, isn't yes, it? William? This is the yeah. contractors thing. So essentially, if it, it will largely impact you if you employ somebody, um, but don't employ them on the payroll, and you pay mm. them through, say, their personal service company. That's yeah. a typical yeah. example of somebody who's caught. And for oh, this was brought in for the public sector a couple That's, of years ago. Yeah. It's now coming for the private sector, and and essentially, all businesses need to review all these sort of people, all their contractors before the end, before the beginning of April. Am I right? The change means that the employer is now liable there is a risk that you as the employer yeah. will become liable for the pays you earn that you and if you don't if, if HMRC decides they're not a, 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 well, a genuine contractor and should be correct. on the payroll you'll be uh, the employer will be liable yes but the the obligation is mm. on the companies mm. the paying companies yeah to work out whether or not these are employees or not yeah it's not um, so it's, it's a bit like self-assessment. Mm. You have to work it out yourself whether mm. you're caught 
so that's one thing. And, and just to add to that, um, what we're seeing certainly from large mm. employers at the moment, they're taking these contractors and making employees. Yes. Or they're encouraging them to sign up with umbrella companies, which will obviously mm. employ them and provide their services to the end mm. user. So they're the what we're seeing on the contractor side. Which I'm sure a lot of the contractors are not very happy about because they were probably quite you know, pleased with the arrangement. Yes. From, yeah. 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 So um, another couple of changes mm. were one of them is that uh, there hasn't actually been a change to inheritance tax. Mm. There was um, there was a lot of discussion about there may being some change, a quite radical change as well, uh, but that. Uh, may come in in the autumn. It may not. I don't. We don't have any indication at the moment. But from April this year, it will be possible uh, to get a million pound lifetime allowance for a couple. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you do have to make sure that you meet the conditions because, uh, and that's quite a big allowance when you yeah. compare it to say yeah. ten years ago before it was introduced. Yeah. But it's been phased in. But it's now fully in from April two thousand and twenty. Um, well, I mean, what we've got here, what we've got in front of us here is uh, what do you do now following mm. the budgets? Mm. And we've got a checklist that, we, mm. that we've sent to our clients. Mm. So we're happy to share that with members if that's what you want us to do. Okay, yeah. we can do that. Um, and the, uh, the maybe one other thing to touch on is allow- we, we talked about the structures and building allowance. Are there any other capital allowances that you want to flag up? Um, I think the the important well, the, I guess one of the important reliefs for capital allowance is the mm. annual investment allowance, and mm. that's been maintained at a million pounds for right. the next year. So yeah. I think that yeah. most that will mostly cover most expenditure that your members will have. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing I would probably say is the enhanced capital allowances on energy efficient products is mm. ceasing um, from April. Um, but I think other than that, I think we've covered most of the things. Oh, there's an enterprise zone as well. It's yeah, because continuing. there is well, there is one in Carlisle. So yeah, yes. that, that's continuing, isn't it? One hundred percent relief there. Yeah. So there are there yeah. are other changes which mm. have already been announced, which come in from April. So for example, if you sell a residential property, uh, and now normally if you if it's your home, you claim principal private yeah. residence relief, so you yeah. don't pay any capital gains tax. But yeah. if you sell a residential property which isn't your home, so you have capital gains tax liability, yeah. from April 2020, you will have to pay capital gains tax within 30 days of the mm-hmm. sale, which is a change and is quite an, an unusual change and one that people will you know, easily miss. Yeah, because they won't necessarily be aware of the, the obligation. No, they won't no. be aware of the obligation, but that is yeah. coming in from the beginning. Yeah. Of April. I don't necessarily even tell their accountants until the year end either, do they? That's the problem. Yeah, that's the point, and it's about how you quantify it as well, mm. because you've got to quanti- quantify what mm. the, the gain is going to be. Yeah. Right, well, thanks thanks very much for that, Jens. But I'd like to finish by putting you on the spot and, and, uh, and asking you to make a couple of, of predictions. First of all, on the the economy, I mean, the growth forecasts that the Chancellor cited from the Office of Budget Responsibility were quite modest. I think 1.1% growth this year, and then I think 1.8% the year after, and then hovering about 1.5% for the rest of the Parliament. But I mean, the caveat he, he, he made was that this those, those projections were before we knew the coronavirus was going to come along. Um, where do you think... The economy will will go. Uh, I mean, do you do you think we'll see any growth this year? Uh, and do you think the UK economy will be able to avoid a recession? I think it's going to be difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it all comes down to how quickly we can deal with the coronavirus. Mm-hmm. I think the longer it goes on, the more certainty with it we're going to end up in a recession, which I guess yeah. is obvious. Mm. Um, but I think it's going to, given all the headwinds that we've had around Brexit, around the election, mm. con- consumer confidence, the, co- the coronavirus, the fact that the, f- the FTSE's priced in difficult mm. times, mm. Um, and that's, at, I think, five and a half at the moment. Mm. Um, I think it's going to be difficult to do. I think if we do achieve it, and let's hope we do, it'll be an amazing achievement to get the growth of this year. Mm. Mm. And the the other one, uh, you know, what, what struck me about the budget was yes, loads of spending, extra additional spending, and it's very little additional taxation to fund that. So it, it's it's it, obviously there will be more borrowing. But I wonder, do you think 
he's avoided, you know, if we hadn't had this coronavirus outbreak, he might have introduced more tax increases in this budget. Uh, but he obviously thought that, that given how weak the economy is, he, he daren't do that at the moment. So do you anticipate that there might be always a sting in the tail and maybe in the autumn budget or even if, if, if the you know, economy is still weak, then he might leave it till next year. But do you think tax increases are coming down the line? I think the, the key thing is to get through our current predicaments as yeah, well. Yeah. So I can understand the statement you've just made. And um, I think once we've got through that, I think if you look at the Tory manifesto, it was very clear that there was going to be no increases in, in the rates of income tax mm. right, and national insurance. So to a certain extent, his hands are tied. Mm. But these are difficult times and he might have to break those rules to balance the books. Mm. But, I, but I, I think if we've got low growth, not not much because the economy is not doing well. There's not much take in terms of tax take. Mm. Then borrowings are going to shoot up, um, and it's just a, it's just a question of how how he deals with that. Mm. But I wouldn't rule out further tax cre- in, increases in the future. Yeah. But I think the immediate immediate I think he's right in what he's doing. I think the immediate action is to stimulate business, put the investment in, mm. and let's get out of this uh, this predicament that we're in. Would you add anything to that, Stephen? No, I agree entirely with that. What Anthony said there. Great. Well, look, thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Cumbria Chamber of Commerce podcast. You can find out more about how we're supporting Cumbrian businesses at cumbriachamber.co.uk and cumbriagrowthhub.co.uk. In the meantime, thank you very much for listening and watch out for the next episode, which we'll be releasing very soon.